Hello, everyone, and welcome to my presentation on container security. I'm going to be talking about practical end-to-end -end container security and how you deploy that at scale. Um, before we begin, a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm based out of California. I've been in security for around six years now. Uh, currently, I lead the product security organization within Twilio. This is the high level agenda of the talk. Uh, we did the intros. Next, I'll talk about motivations behind the talk and then go into what practical container security means and also cover why traditional approaches do not work in the world of containers. After that, we'll take a look at a simple container deployment pipeline and the different security checkpoints you can have within that pipeline. Then we'll talk about scaling and different issues that I've seen with scaling. At Twilio, we usually start with why. So what is my motivation for giving a security-focused talk at a developer conference? Uh, I truly believe that security is everyone's responsibility and want to share my learnings with you in the hope that it'll help you as a developer who's building out really cool stuff um, to better secure your products. Before we get into measures that you can take to secure your containers, let's talk a little bit about what's considered practical. Something that needs constant manual attention is not really practical. Something that doubles your deployment time, not practical either. I personally would define practical as something that is automatable. Uh, sure, it may take a little time in the beginning, but as time goes by, if the amount of human work decreases, uh, that works. Something that gets results, like tangible results to users, something that can scale, and uh, most importantly, something that enables users and developers to move fast, but in a secure fashion. Traditional approaches uh, have usually been to find vulnerabilities and then file JIRA tickets in the development team's backlog to fix them. There's an SLA assigned to it, uh, which is usually in line with the vulnerability management standards. Uh, and then the development team at some point gets to their backlog, looks at this ticket and tries to fix it. But containers are super fast. If you take the traditional approach, by the time a team gets to the vulnerability ticket, the container may not even exist. So a more practical approach in the world of containers is to embed the controls and uh, security mechanisms in the deployment process and to give as near real-time feedback as possible. Here I have a very rudimentary diagram representing a generic container deployment pipeline. Um, on the left, you start off with the developers, you do some local testing, build out your Docker files, Docker Compose files, um, build out your containers locally. Once you're satisfied, you push it onto your code repository. Um, after that, that's picked up by our build system, which builds out your artifacts and pushes them to uh, Docker registry. Then you have your deployment mechanism, something like Kubernetes or Docker Swarm or similar, which takes the artifacts that your build system pushed to your registry and then deploys them to the different environments you may have, dev, stage, prod, or however you have things set up. Now, if you were to put in security controls within this pipeline, this is how it would look. Um, the annotations in red that you see are different uh, places in the pipeline that you can put in different security checks. There are things like base image security, vulnerability scanning, registry security, Docker demons and uh, uh, Docker daemon security, and runtime security. We'll look at each one of them in detail. Let's start off with base image security. Base image is the layer on which you build the rest of your containers on. Uh, essentially what you add in a Docker file when you write like from so-and-so container. If that layer is not secure, everything you build on top of it will inherently be insecure. If, for example, you use a container known to have a crypto miner as your base image, then pretty much any 
Docker container that you run on top of this will have a crypto miner and essentially your infrastructure is making money for someone else at this point. Uh, the different things you can do for securing your base images. Uh, first, um, first step is to have a small list of allowed base images. Do not allow any and all container images off of the internet to be usable. Better yet would be to internally host these base images so you control what's going on them. Once you have a whitelisted set of base images, try and keep these images as small and as bare bones as possible because every package, every software you put on a base image will be loaded onto every container even if it does not need, need it. And this impacts both security and speed because now you have widespread uh, installation of a package that's not, not really needed to run what the container is running. Um, something that's really cool that recently came out is uh, distro list base images. Um, I would highly encourage everyone to go check them out. Now that you have a small number of base images, you need to regularly patch those images to keep them up to date with all the security fixes and patches being released. This is pretty much similar to any patch management cycle that you have in your organization. Once you patch your base images regularly, you would be releasing a new version or a tag. Uh, next step would be to find a way to get all your Docker files to new, use the newly released tag. Um, there are two ways that I've seen this being done. One is to use the latest tag um, and have an automated release or build process, say every two weeks. So whenever this automated build process happens, when the latest tag points to the new base image that you released, all of those updates will be picked up. The other way is to update your Docker files when new tags or versions are released. One issue with using the latest tag is, uh, and having automated releases, it sometimes um, things may break. We talked about base image security. Now let's uh, look into how you secure your container registries. Um, as you all know, registries are a storage and distribution mechanism for all your container images. Um, this is essentially where all your artifacts live. All these artifacts will have your code. So your container registry will pretty much have a form of your code. So if you do not secure your registries, your source code may be at risk of being stolen or worse yet, um, it may be altered by a malicious actor. The images on the slide are different registry providers. You may be using one of them. There are some that I haven't had space on the slide to put. So that's just a small representation. Uh, this is just a screenshot of a bug bounty submission on Twitter, which was rewarded $10,000. The submission essentially said uh, Wine's container registry was open to the public and the uh, researcher was able to jump all of their source code with all the secrets in them. You don't want to do that. So how do you secure your container registry? There are a bunch of things that you can do. Use a private registry. A private registry is something that requires authentication uh, for pulling or pushing data from the registry. Anyone off the internet without credentials should not be able to pull data off of your registry. Role-based access control. This is in line with the principle of least privilege. First, you added authentication. Next, you use authorization. There are different teams in the organization. Some of them need access to read. Some of them read, need access to read and write. Not everyone needs the same level of access. So taking a little bit of time to make sure that everyone has the appropriate amount of permissions to do their job and not more than that goes a long way to protect your assets. Using AV2 Docker registry. V1 is the older version, so make sure you're not operating a V1 registry. Configure your registry with uh, proper SSL and valid certificates, so data is not tampered um, in transit. 
Docker Content Trust, or DCT, provides the ability to use digital signatures for data sent to and received from remote Docker registries. These signatures allow client-side or runtime verification of the integrity um, of the publisher and of specific tags. Cool, so we saw some ways to secure your registry. Let's talk about vulnerability scanning. Vulnerability scanning as a principle is aimed at finding issues. Traditional vulnerability scanning looks for weaknesses in servers, systems, or networks. In the container world, vulnerability scanning looks at the different layers in the containers and checks for security flaws uh, in those layers. There are numerous open source and commercial scanners available today. Anchor Engine and Claire are some examples of open source ones, whereas Sneak, Aquasec, TwistLock, BlackDuck are some of the commercial ones out there. There are many ways in which you can implement a container vulnerability scanner into your um, SDLC. First option would be to add them to your build process. So every time a container image is built in your build system, uh, it kicks off a scan. Most scanners also have a plugin, which lets you sort of define rules when you can break rules. So essentially you can say, if a critical vulnerability is found during the build, um, immediately stop my build and notify me. This helps you move fast and in a secure way. One thing I would point out here is if you're integrating a, a scanner in your build process, make sure that you show results of the scanner uh, to the users in the build system, which enables them to sort of see what's been flagged and how they can fix them. The second option is um, you can enable vulnerability scanning in your Docker registry. A lot of registries these days are offering vulnerability scanning as a service. Another thing I would mention is like wherever you uh, had scanning in your pipeline, make sure there's a self-service option for people to uh, scan their local builds to test things out so that they don't have to initiate a result, a release just to get the scan results. A couple of things to keep in mind when selecting a scanner is what vulnerability sources um, the scanner looks into. For example, if you majorly run Amazon Linux, then you need to make sure that the scanner has Amazon advisories as a source for its vulnerability database. Deployment model, scan times, feature set, and price sort of go hand in hand. So that's one thing you want to keep an eye out on. Now that we looked at um, vulnerability scanning, let's take a quick look at Docker daemon security. Docker Daemon is a service that runs on your host. It exposes an API to which your client, like the Docker CLI, talks to, to sort of run containers, stop containers, and everything around them. These are some of the things that uh, can be done. There are a lot of customizations that the Daemon offers. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail about them. But some things that you can do, which are in the security space of the Daemon config, are Things like setting resource limits, setting namespaces, library stores, etc. The options that you set in the daemon config get associated with all the containers that you run on the host. If there are options that you want to specify for certain containers, you can set them during runtime uh, using the runtime options. Uh, there are things here that you can set like an app armor profile, SE Linux, um, specifically disable privileged containers, run containers as read only and other things. Since I didn't go into uh, depth about um, Docker daemon configs and runtime options, I'll mention this resource here. The Docker bench for security is a script released by Docker that checks for dozens of common best practices and has been inspired by the Docker CIS benchmark. This is a sample output of the Docker bench script. As you can see, it checks for common daemon configs as well. Similar to Docker bench, there is a kube bench, uh, which is in line with Kubernetes CIS best practices.
Let's talk about logging and alerting within containers. Logging in containers is pretty versatile. There is support for various log drivers, so you should be able to integrate container logs into whatever logging mechanism you use in your organization. Some of the things you want to alert on in the container world are things like um, a shell being spawned on a running container, or if a privilege escalation is detected from a container. How do you do the alerting though? Uh, there are a bunch of enterprise and open source tools that do this for you. Take a look at them based on budget and the appetite for using tools. Uh, one of them may fit your need. Now that we finished with logging and alerting, let's quickly cover some issues that may occur while using container scanning at scale. Um, if you're blocking builds, make sure you specify to block only when there is a public patch available. Otherwise, you'll be in this weird situation where there is no actionable fix, but your release is blocked. Can't really do much there. Um, other things to watch out for is if you do not delete or regularly clean up old tags from your scanner, the database is going to grow huge. One issue that uh, I personally faced when implementing container scanning is uh, in regards to test uh, container builds. Our internal build team had a regular um, automated builds that just made sure that the build machines were running in a stable manner, which meant that these regular builds were being scanned and that sort of doubled the total number of images that we were scanning. What we ended up doing was writing a script that periodically went into the scanner's database and deleted these test images. And that helped sort of fine tune our processing. These are some of the resources I would suggest you take a look at. Um, things have changed, but these are some things that I have used uh, personally in the past. Um, the GitHub link with the Vegemonk org or the repos uh, has a lot of Docker tools that you can use for security and for other uh, Docker related stuff like networking um, and things like that. Uh, thanks a lot for your time. This is the end of the presentation. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have.